Welcome back to my channel. My name is Thomas A. Bushnell and I'm an attorney licensed to practice law in Idaho, Washington, in California. And in this part of our estate planning series, we're going to be talking about a pour over will and a trust and how they work together instead of using just a standard will. If you refer to that chart we've been using, and you'll see A, B, and C, and C is probate when the second spouse passes away. If you get two words from this entire series, it's this, probate bad. Probate sucks. Probate takes nine months to a year, $5,000, $8,000 on the average. It could be as little as two or three. It could be a whole lot more if people fight or things are not in order. And so what I would like to do is help people save money, get things passed on to their kids, and of course, try to keep the government out of their estate plan. So a pour over will is a will that pours over all your non-probatable assets into a trust. A trust is something we form while you're living called a living trust or sometimes called an inter vivos trust. And it's almost like having say a shell company or a shell corporation where you put it, but it's not a corporation, but you put your probatable assets in there. And I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Tom, what's a probatable asset? A probatable asset is an asset that if you die and your name's on it, it will subject your estate to probate. And probate is something we're trying to avoid. To avoid probate, the tool we normally use, and there are other exceptions, are trusts. We use trusts for two purposes, to avoid probate and to maintain your privacy. So on the next slide coming up that says probate chart, you're going to see across the top what are the probatable assets. And across the bottom, you're going to see some of the highlights of a probate. So the first thing I'd like to address is the privacy issue. You can see in the bottom right, it'll say you have to open a probate. You have to do an application that says original of the will. Here in Idaho, the original of the will or a certified copy must accompany the application to be the personal representative, sometimes called executor, executrix, administrator, administratrix. But let's just use the word personal representative to cover all of those. So when your personal representative applies to get testamentary letters with the court, when you're doing a probate, you have to send the will over there. Then anyone here in Idaho, at least can pay a dollar a page, or if they have extended access to the court system, they don't have to pay anything and they can get a copy of your will and find out what went to whom and who got left out. And if someone got more and it's just none of their business and privacy is a very important issue and we want to maintain it. So we use a trust because a trust is a private document. And the other thing, of course, the trust is to avoid probate. So to avoid probate, we have to take those probatable assets and let's move them into our trust. Okay. So here's our trust. All right. The number one probatable asset, as you can see on that chart, the number one thing is real property, a house and land. Okay. You might have another piece of property too. That's real property. What we use is a quick claim deed to move the property into the trust. And now it's no longer officially in your name. It's officially in the name of the trust. It's a living trust that you control, but now it's in the name of the trust and we've avoided probate for that issue. The number two reason for probates and the number one reason for lawsuits in probates and a significant factor in underfunded estates are bank accounts. So, okay, you got a bank account here. First of all, if it has no payable on death, then the only way that account can be got into is after you pass away, if, it isn't, if there's no joint account and there's no payable on death, the only way it can be gotten into is with a testamentary letter. The only way you can get a testamentary letter is if you open a probate. So let's take a typical bank account. There's husband and wife. They're the owners. They can sign on that bank account. Okay. Now, let's say that we went to YouTube and we watched a video and why women live longer than men. And you hear the classic line, here, hold my beer, watch this. And the husband does something stupid, wins a Darwin Award, and he's now gone. So everything goes to wife. This is called with rights of survivorship. More than nine out of 10, probably 98, 99 out of 100 husband and wife bank accounts are like this. If you're a single person or 
If you uh, have a significant other, but you're not legally married, and you have a sole account, okay, you have a sole account, that's just you, the only signer. If it does not have a payable on death, you're going to be in the same boat right here as you would be right there. And what boat is that? That, let's say, husband passed away and everything goes to wife and then wife passed away. The only thing you can do in this case, or if in this case, is the bank would have to make it payable to the estate of, in this case, wife, or the estate of you, in this case. And what does that mean? Well, whenever you see the word to the estate of, that means we're in probate land. And your kids are going to have to come down and pay me $2,000 up front to open a probate. But you can avoid all that by handling your bank account properly. Here's how. People look at this and they say, aha, what we need is a payable on death. All right? We're going to make this payable on death over here. And let's say you've got say four kids. I'm gonna make it payable on death to this one right here, number two. I know this child will share it with all the others. And you can even make them another signer on your account. But the question is, are they an owner or are they just added for your lifetime as a signer? Makes a huge difference. Any way you look at it, if you end up with one of these, you leave it all to child number two, for example here, and I've seen this many times, you're asking for a lawsuit. There's something you have no control over, or very little control, and that is who your child marries. Let's say your child has a spouse, and let's say they don't like this one, and they don't like that one, and all the money goes to them, and they say, you know what? We don't like you. We're not giving you any money. Do they have to? Well, as any lawyer would tell you, well, that depends. That depends upon were they a signer, were they an owner, uh, and here in Idaho, if they were a signer and not an owner, then what happens is they can keep the money unless these folks sue them. Then the burden shifts to this person to prove separate donative intent. That sounds like a lot of mumbo jumbo, but we've just hit the trifecta of law. You know, in Christianity, they have the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, in the practice of law, well, there's kind of an unholy trinity of a combination of money, bitterness, and confusion. Money, bitterness, and confusion. And folks, you got it all right here. You got money coming from the bank account. You got bitterness with someone mad at somebody else not wanting to share. And you have confusion because it's a highly litigatable area of law. And what happens when you have these lawsuits, you know who the winner is. That's right, the lawyers. The lawyers are going to win on both sides and take a significant portion of your estate to fight over this. So we don't want to make it payable on death just to one child. So you go, aha, I know what I'm going to do. I'm not going to make that mistake. I'm going to avoid the probate. We'll add the POD. I'm going to avoid the lawsuit because I'm not going to give it to one. I'm going to go like this. Now, you may be able to do that, and it may work fine, or it may cause an underfunded estate. If you have other significant liquid assets that you're a uh, successor trustee, the person handling your estate, can get into to pay for your funeral, pay for your ambulance, pay for your lack of medical expense, pay off any outstanding bills. If that money is available, then you're fine. But what often happens over here, you know, we got the house and stuff in our trust, like we talked about earlier. And now what happens is this person over here is managing your estate. And the money went to these four and well, we need money. All the money or a significant portion of it went here and we need money to pay the funeral home. We need money to pay the last hospital bill. We need money to pay this. What are we gonna do? Well, should we take just this person's share or should we go to child one, three, and four and say, hey, can you send some of that money over this way? You know what they say, what money? It's spent, it's gone, sorry. And so now you end up with an underfunded estate and it causes lots of trouble for this child. So what we do is we put a bank account in the name of the trust, okay? We make all of your bank accounts, and that doesn't matter how many you have, all payable on death to this same bank account. There's two ways we can do this. Generally speaking, and there are exceptions, if you have a personal account, either with a husband and wife, or you're a single person, it's a sole account, generally you can change the name on that account. We use the certification of trust, Put that right here. That's a cert, that's an E, certification of trust to 
either change the name on this bank account to turn it into the trust or open a new bank account in the name of the trust and then you have all your bank accounts checking and savings payable on death either to the trust account if you just change the name here or to the new account down there and we use the term payable on death for bank accounts we use the term beneficiary designation for uh, investments iras life insurance pretty much means the same thing but for for banking it's payable on death and it need to have a payable on death to the trust you avoid the problem with having to open a probate you avoid the lawsuit and you avoid the underfunded estate so that's the way we handle bank accounts as we continue our discussion of how to avoid a probate by putting our probatable assets into the trust the next thing on our list is safe deposit boxes if you have a safe deposit box and just you and singular or you and your spouse are the only owners of that safe deposit box the only way your children can get into that safe deposit box is with testamentary letters in other words we're in probate land again so there's two options you have either a make one of your children a co-owner of that safe deposit box the downside is they can get into it any time or b better still just don't have one instead here in north idaho everyone prefers to have a large fireproof gun safe uh, two or three is even better but having a large fireproof gun safe put your important documents in there and then you don't have to worry about a, a, a safe deposit box triggering a probate i had a son and daughter came in and they had parents had made the daughter the personal representative or the successor trustee for a very good reason and they came in and the son came in too and everything was in order and they didn't have to open a probate but for that safe deposit box and the son said oh dad always said buy gold the irs is, is unconstitutional and our money is just fiat money well whether you agree with that or not is really immaterial but you can see where he's coming from dad always said buy gold i am sure that safe deposit box is full of gold and his sister replied brother i believe your head is full of rocks but he prevailed they paid fifteen hundred dollars up front it's now two thousand up front to open a probate and for some reason they invited me to the bank when they went to open it and they opened that safe deposit box does anyone remember and recall geraldo rivera and al capone's crypt yes that's what it was like there was a deed in there from a piece of property they'd sold 12 years previous nothing silch not a money wasted you know i hope you like me i hope you like me a lot but there's no reason to throw money at me that should go to your children so safe deposit boxes just don't have one get a fireproof gun safe the next one is are your parents still living are you the beneficiary of another person's will or trust now this one you may not be able to do anything about but if you are the beneficiary of another person's will or trust if you pass away before say your parents do and that will or trust does not have an alternate designation so like for example if my daughter predeceases me then it goes to her children if it doesn't have that and you'd be surprised if it doesn't have that designation you would be surprised at how many times they just don't and if that's the case then we would have to open a summary administration at the least sometimes a probate so being the beneficiary of another person's will or trust that's not completely done and done properly can trigger a probate or a, at the very least a summary administration for your estate if you pass away before that person the next item on our list is mineral rights do you have mineral rights for which you're receiving royalties oil rights in north dakota wyoming gas rights or something like that those are probatable assets those are transferred by a deeds that are recorded at the county we simply do a quick claim deed moving those mineral rights into your trust i say simply sometimes it's not so simple because you have fractional interest and get confusing but that's generally the idea mineral rights can trigger a probate so if you have mineral rights let's just put them in here mineral rights if you have some we put those into the trust um, here in idaho our local cemetery actually issues deeds for burial plots that are recorded at the county not all jurisdictions have that not all states have that but here in boundary county with our local uh, cemetery uh, 
They have deeds that are recorded to the county. That makes them probatable assets. Well, if you just have one plot and you plan on using it, no big deal. Burial plots and sometimes can trigger a probate. If you're in a jurisdiction or if your cemetery issues deeds that are recorded to the county, we just put them in the trust to avoid that if you have more than one. Uh, the next issue is promissory notes. A promissory note, let's say you sell some property and you carry the contract. You have a promissory note that's secured by a deed of trust. So that promissory note is a probatable asset because when you pass away, the person has to make out a check to someone. If they make it out to you, oops, you're going to have to have testamentary letters in order to cash that check or deposit it. Instead, what we do is we assign that promissory note that's secured by a deed of trust. We assign it into the trust. So let's just put our promissory note here. Promise. A promissory note promised to pay secured by a deed of trust into the trust into the trust it goes and now we've avoided that one uh, vehicles motor vehicles are not pro necessarily at all probatable assets but they can cause some consternation or some confusion on how we pass them along there's numerous ways and I don't think for time restrictions we'll get into it but there are numerous ways to pass motor vehicles on either through a specific gift in your will, a specific items page at the back of the will, or you can put the vehicle into the trust. And that's a fine way to go too, especially if you have like collector vehicles. You put a vehicle in the trust, and then if you and your spouse pass away, the successor trustee, we'll get into what a successor trustee is, could then sell that uh, car without any problem. The next item we're gonna talk about, which is not necessarily a probatable asset, are firearms. Firearms get tricky when they cross state lines after you pass away. Here in North Idaho, everybody values their privacy and owns firearms. Maybe where you're at, you don't, but here we do, so we have to deal with them. So with a firearm, if you pass away, your spouse can give them to your children while you're alive, and they can take them to their jurisdiction as long as they're not illegal to have in that jurisdiction as long as they follow federal laws for transporting firearms and state laws as well so for example if you're going to go from washington to california you'd have to pass through oregon don't don't try to take a firearm through oregon it's very complicated and very messy so what happens though is if when you pass away you leave your firearms to someone in a different state than what you're in, then federal law controls. So here in Idaho, we say, if you pass away, leave your guns to somebody in Idaho, one of your children in Idaho, or anybody in Idaho. If you send your guns, say, to California, well, what has to happen then is you have to get a class three dealer in Idaho and a class three dealer in California, and then fill out the forms with the ATF, send the firearm down to California, then you have, they notify you, and then you have to do some more paperwork and have a prescribed waiting period, and then you can come up and pick up that gun. Unless, what if it's an AR-15 with a front, front pistol grip or an air cooler? Oh, suddenly that's now an assault style rifle, whatever that is, they call it an assault rifle, and then that'll just get confiscated and destroyed. So. Uh, Pass your rifles and shotguns and handguns on while you're still living and you can avoid that whole mess. Otherwise, it gets into a mess. Now, if you have Category 2 firearms, and if you have them, you know what they are. Uh, uh, noise suppressors, machine guns, uh, things of that nature. Yes, those are legal to own here in Idaho, but you have to have that federal stamp. If you have any type of those, I'd advise you at that point to get a gun trust. And the person I would send you to is Alex Kincaid in Boise, Idaho. She is, in my opinion, the foremost gun rights expert in Idaho or possibly in the West. But Alex Kincaid in Boise, Idaho can whip you up a gun trust if you have Category 2 firearms that are uh, regulated by the Firearms Act of 1934 or 1968. Now we've gone through, as you can see on the chart on your screen, We've gone through the probatable assets. Then down below, across the bottom, you're going to see some of the highlights of opening a probate and running a probate. As I mentioned earlier, you have an application, the original of the will, you get an acceptance, you get testamentary letters, you get a statement of informal probate. And then 
once you're appointed, you have three months in Idaho. I'm just going to stick to Idaho. Rules are different in different jurisdictions. You have three months. You shall file an inventory. So someone has to count the assets and, and make an inventory of everything in a probate. We're trying to avoid all the probate hassle. Also, you have 30 days after you're appointed to do a notice to creditors and an information to heirs. An information to heirs goes to all the children. If any of the children have passed away, it would go to the grandchildren. It would go to anybody named in the will. And those can be rather expensive, $100, $125 a pop for those to go out. And then the notice to creditors is in the newspaper. So you have some, some deadlines that within three months you have to do the inventory. And then once it's published in the newspaper, that's called the notice to creditors, you have to wait at least four months before you can close the probate. Now, as you see on the page, if you do everything just boom, 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 can you get it done in six months? Yeah, but it never happens that way. Come on, this is law. It never happens that way. That's why I say nine months to a year to get the probate done. And there's all these documents. You can see the inventory. You can see the four months. And then the different ways. There's different ways to close a probate depending upon how many heirs there are, if it's contested or not. But the final accounting or a waiver and release and a petition to close and an order closing. Uh, lots of stuff for the lawyer to do to hit you with more fees and, and have a hearing and things like that. So if we can avoid the probate, that's a good thing most of the time.